OK, great. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, this is our final in the, in our series of CPD in 43 for 2021. Um, we have uh, Taj from Hydrock here with us who will be talking about fire safety design, um, current guidance and legislation, uh, along with common design issues. Um, obviously, it's a very, very uh, big subject um, that everyone is, should be well aware of. Um, huge changes are coming um, fast thick and fast um, into legislation, the way we do planning, um, uh, technical side of things, uh, it's affected everyone's insurance, etc. So uh, it's something that everyone should be um, very much interested in for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, we're looking forward to Taj explaining this further. Um, just whilst we've got you here, uh, we've got um, a whole range of events already planned for 2022. We've yet to release the um, uh, calendar of events, but please do bear with us. Uh, we shall start uh, advertising those in due course. Please do look at our SIA Wessex event bright page along with our Instagram, along with Facebook and also uh, relevant uh, links on LinkedIn. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, just obviously whilst uh, Taj does uh, does the talk, please do feel free to use a chat box uh, for any questions for our Q&A session uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, so both myself and Joe from Site Wessex will be here in the background to field any questions, queries, etc. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with us directly. The slides for the event will be made available via the Eventbrite uh, email that goes out following this um, presentation. Um, and if you have any further questions, please do ask. So, Taj, if you just take over. Yes, thank you, Ezwan. I'll just share my screen. OK, I think that should be visible to everyone. OK, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today for this fire safety CBD presented by Hydrock. Uh, this CBD completes a fantastic series of talks arranged for 2021. I know Usman and his team are planning a similar series for 2022, so do stay tuned for further talks on a variety of interesting topics in the new year. A bit about me, uh, I work as a fire engineer at Hydrock. My day-to-day -day responsibilities involve developing fire safety strategies, fire statements, carrying out fire simulation modeling, and contributing to external war assessments. So to give you an overview of what's going to be covered in the next half an hour, uh, I'll begin the presentation by providing a brief introduction about Hydrock and some of the projects we have, in, we have worked on. Uh, then I will share a timeline of significant events that has shaped the fire safety industry and influencing current and future legislation. We'll have a run through of the upcoming planning gateways and the fire safety bill. After that, I'll discuss current guidance and then anticipated changes to current guidance based on documents currently out for consultation. I'll then discuss common design issues based on my personal experience. Those will be relating to stair protection requirements, re-entering corners, evacuation lifts and facilities for firefighting. And finally, I'll end the presentation with a brief insight on our experience with on-site fire safety auditing. So brief, uh, so a bit, so brief bit about Hydrock. Uh, Hydrock are a national multi-disc engineering, sustainability, and energy consultancy. We are well recognised for our traditional multidisciplinary engineering services such as structural, civil, geotechnical, transport, and MEP engineering, to name a few. Hydrock are well spread nationally around the UK, our main focus of operations in the southwest, however. The Fire Safety Division was set up in 2017. We are a team of 63, consisting of fire safety professionals, fire safety managers and operations personnel. Our capabilities as a Fire Safety Division are noted on the screen. We provide fire, fire engineering services that involve developing fire strategies for new builds and existing buildings. We have a well-established fire safety management team where our fire risk managers undertake fire risk assessments and external wall surveys. We also have consultants that advise on nuclear and industrial safety case, expert witness and structural, structural fire engineering. Our engineers proactively contribute to research development in the, in the field. 
So next, here are some of our recent projects uh, the Fire Safety Division has been involved in. Middle locks in Salford, Manchester. Services include retrospective assessments on external walls on existing buildings on site, plus fire engineering services on all rebus stages of work. The Rockery at the Hyde in North London. This project transforms the Brownfield site into a new multi-layered mixed-use community development. The development consists of three buildings ranging from 20 to 24 storeys. Fire engineering services were provided to support the scheme to obtain planning permission. Finally, one I expect our audience will be familiar with, the UE Engineering Building at Frenchy Campus. Hydrock delivered fire engineering services to completion. This included computational fluid dynamics assessments to support the internal layout arrangements. OK, so now that you have a better idea of who we are and what our capability is, let's start the next segment of the presentation. First, I'd like to show a significant timeline of events from the past few years that has shaped the fire safety industry. The timeline you can see now is mainly focused on the past four years since, since Grenfell Tower fire. The timeline includes all the key advice issued by the government as shown in symbols in green and the significant fires that were considered to include fire spread by the external walls as displayed as a flame. The slide is busy and that is purposeful as this is what the building owners, building designers and fire safety professionals have had to navigate over the last four years, which has been challenging for some. Looking at the left of the slide, I would like to highlight the Lacknell House fire in South London back in 2019, 2009. At the start of the timeline, reason being it's, it, uh, there was no government response or change to legislation after this fire uh, occurred, even though the fire resulted in a number of deaths due to fire spread across the external wall. The significant advice outlined within the timeline was issued by the government swiftly after Grenfell Tower fire. All the, all the guidance notes issued by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government have been consolidated into a single document that was issued on the 20th of January 2020. There are a number of notable omissions from the timeline, which I'll go through next. The Grenfell Phase 1 report, which was published in October 2019, focused on the factual narrative of these tragic events in the early hours of the morning on the 14th of June of 2017. It is clear that the use of combustible materials in the external walls of Grenfell Tower, principally in the form of ACM rain screen cladding, but also in the form of combustible insulation, were the reason why the fire spread so quickly to the whole of the building. The findings of the inquiry identified failures further contributing to fire spread. Those are numerous fire doors were held open or the closing mechanism was redundant. Fire doors had been replaced by non-tested fire doors. Fire compartmentation had been generally breached due to gas servicing undertaken during the refurbishment. The lift did not operate as a firefighting lift and the smoke control systems in the stair did not maintain the escape free of smoke. After the Grenfell Tower fire, a panel of experts led by Dame Judith Hackett was commissioned by the UK government. The aim was to carry out an independent review of the building regulations and fire safety. This expert panel was set up in July 2017, which is a clear reactive response to the Grenfell Tower fire that occurred on the 14th of June 2017. The final report was issued May 2018, which is available in the public domain for professionals to review, which I'm sure many of the audience will be familiar with by now. The conclusions of the report found that the current system of building regulations and the fire safety is not fit for purpose. A cultural change is required to support the delivery of buildings that are safe now and in the future. A number of recommendations were made. However, as we are short for time, I will choose to focus on three recommendations. First, competency. Revolving around the skills, knowledge, expertise and behaviours of practitioners in the building industry. Secondly, a new regulatory framework focused in the first instance on multi-occupancy, higher risk residential buildings. And finally, the golden thread, creating a golden thread of information so that it's available throughout the building lifespan. So the first recommendation, competency, Dame Judith Hackett discussed three avenues, which I'd like to expand on briefly. The first, establishing effective leadership. Dame Judith Hackett remarks on addressing technical competence, where she, she, where she notes that there is a pressing need to see leadership that is required within the construction industry and fire safety sector to drive the shift in culture. The second, developing a competence framework for higher risk residential buildings. And the third recommendation, the competence of the regulator and duty holder. A, fundamal, a fundamental element uh, of the new regulatory framework for higher risk residential buildings is the creation of the newly formed Joint Competent Authority, short for JCA, 
The JCA is comprised of the Health and Safety Executive, Local Authority Building Standards and the Fire and Rescue Authority. She concludes that there's no doubt that competence and accreditation is going to be a major feature in the future. So the second recommendation made by Dame Judith Hackett that I'll dis discuss today is the Building Safety Regulator. The Building Safety Regulator housed in the HSC will be introduced to enforce Building Act by monitoring the, safe, uh, the safety and performance of all buildings. Its aim will be to secure the safety of all occupants within buildings. It is their ambition to further improve safety standards across all buildings in general. The Building Safety Regulator will regulate high-rise residential buildings at first instance, so by this I mean buildings that are seven or more storeys and are 18 metres in height uh, or above. It also co covers hospitals, care homes, student accommodation only during design and construction phases. Taking a look at the infographic on screen, I will expand on the roles and processes that go hand in hand with the regulator, which are the role of the accountable person, the building insurance certificate uh, and the appointed building safety manager. The accountable person. Uh, the duty holders in the occupation phase are regarded as the accountable person. This means that the accountable person could be a freehold owner, sub landlord, tenant or management company, which has a repairing obligation within the building. In essence, the aim here is to have a nominated individual or entity that is accountable and that can be held uh, accountable for the safety of buildings that they own. Towards completion of the project, the accountable person must apply to the building safety regulator for a building assurance certificate. This is expected that the accountable person will need to ensure the golden thread of information to the building safety regulator. I'll expand this later in the presentation. The building safety manager, an existing but key role to the regulatory framework, is going to be tasked with operating and maintaining the building safety case throughout the building's occupation. The building safety manager role extends beyond fire safety. It will expect it to cover structural safety and gas safety, to name a few. The third and final recommendation I'll discuss today, made by Dame Judith Hackett, is the golden thread of information. Under the, new, under the new Building Safety Bill, there will be an obligation to create a digital record for all high-rise residential buildings at the first instance. This can be achieved by creating a golden thread of information throughout the design, build and ongoing through to the occupation of the buildings. This package of information will be used by the duty holders to demonstrate to the regulator, which I mentioned earlier, that an adequate level of safety for the, for the building can be maintained throughout its life cycle. Looking at the current timeline and projected timeline, the draft safety bill was published in July 2020. The revised bill was published in February 2021, and the Building Safety Act is anticipated to be published towards the tail end of 2023. There is a further transition period expected to take place up until 2024. The minimum requirements are where the, where the minimum requirements are established. So fundamental to the collection of data uh, for, is gateways, gateways one, two, and three, as shown on screen. In order to ensure that the building safety risks are considered at each stage of the building's design and construction, it is proposed for a series of robust gateways points to strengthen the regulatory oversight. This will be implemented through design, build, and occupation of the building. So for gateway one. It utilizes the existing planning permission application process and will be fulfilled by those applying for planning permission for developments containing high risk buildings. So what does this mean for in terms of deliverables for design teams? In addition to the collection of information discussed earlier, design teams will need to, co to complete the planning gateway one fire statement. This fire statement will need to consider items relevant to land use planning, such as site layout and fire tender access. For clarity, as many on the call will know now, it does not need to contain a full fire strategy review of all fire items B1 to B5. The fire statement needs to be carried out by a suitably accredited professional, such as a chartered engineer with the IFE or a similar established body. So moving on from Gateway 1, the details and requirements of a worth gate planning Gateway 2 and 3 are yet to be defined in detail. However, I will run through what is expected for those gateways. At Gateway 2, the client will be required to submit key information to the Building Safety Regulator, mentioned earlier, housed under the Health and Safety Executive. This key information will need to demonstrate on how they are complying with the building regulations. This will be through the submission of full plans, the construction control plans, and environment and emergency file. The client will also be required to ensure that they are satisfied with the principal designer and principal contractor so that they can demonstrate the necessary competence to discharge their responsibilities effectively. Moving on to Gateway 3, 
once the project has been tendered and handed over to the contractor, the same principles of data collection will need to take place. The involvement with the building safety regulator continues where the client will continue to submit information to the regulator. Uh, so this would include updates on as-built plans indicating any agreed variations since Gateway 2, inspection records, a complete construction control plan, and updated fire and emergency file. At Gateway 3, the client, principal designer, and principal contractor will, all, will also be required to produce a, and co-sign a final declaration confirming that, to the best of their knowledge, the building complies with the building regulations. So to summarize the oversight from the building safety regulator will be required at all gateways. At gateway one, a fire statement that utilizes the existing planning permission application process is required. At gateway two, a full submission of supporting information demonstrating design and compliance will be required. At gateway three, evidence of compliance through construction, commissioning, inspection records, statements from the architects and contractors will be required. With all this data captured during the gateways, a golden thread of information is established. The golden thread of information ensures that the right people have the right information at the right time, thus effectively ensuring buildings are safe and building safety risks are managed throughout the building's life cycle. This information is expected to be held digitally and will ensure that the original design intent and any subsequent changes to the building are captured and preserved. Once construction is complete, relevant documents related to the building safety must be handed over to the accountable person. With the golden thread of information, the, account the accountable person uses this to apply to the building assurance certificate. Thereafter, the accountable person will appoint a building safety manager who operates and maintains the building. The cultural change put forward by Dame Judith Hackett will no doubt see the input of end users, i.e. the accountable person, at all stages of the development. The obligation under the Building Safety Bill will promote the accountable person to have a vested interest in ensuring that the data that they have been handed over is accurate and contains all the necessary details to, save, to safely operate the building. So now that we've familiarised ourselves with the planning gateways, the upcoming Building Safety Act and how this all ties into the initial recommendations made by Dame Judith Hackett, uh, the next segment of the presentation is going to focus on the current fire guidance. So the most revision uh, uh, issued of approved document B, it was in May 2020, and I'm sure the audience has been accustomed to documents used by now. Volume one and two have been restructured and simplified to provide clear guidance to achieve, uh, to achieve compliance. Generally, there is less introductions at the start of the sections, less fire engineering explanations, and it is more straight to the point uh, in order to achieve compliance, a welcome change for by many. Those in the audience who have worked with fire engineers in the past would have seen the fire strategy reports developed to BS 9999 and BS 999-1. BS 999-991 allow the fire engineer to take a more holistic approach to fire safety design. It allows compensatory measures to be taken into account within designs, such as benefits from including sprinkler protection and the occupants being familiar with the building. In other words, it takes into account the additional time that these features will provide, which approved document did not do historically in the past. So from a non-residential setting, uh, it, so in non-residential settings, fire engineers utilize different fire guidance documents to complement approved document volume two, examples of which are shown on slide. We use BB100 uh, for fire safety design in schools, HTM documents for fire safety design of healthcare premises, and defense infrastructure fire standards, formerly known as Crown standards for Ministry of Defense projects. So looking at updates from ADB issued in May 2020, the main changes revolve around residential buildings height threshold for sprinklers being reduced to 11 meters, a requirement for consistent wayfinding signage in residential buildings above 11 meters, updates reflecting the building amendment regulations of 2018 pertaining to the ban of combustible materials and external walls of buildings. So looking at the changes uh, to fire suppression requirements first, residential buildings with an occupied story above 11 meters are required to be sprinkler protected. The actual statement in ADB is that sprinkler protection should be provided throughout the building. Therefore, all rooms should be provided with sprinkler protection, such as a bike store, for example, even if they are accessed directly from the outside with no connection to the communal circulation areas. ADB remarks on sprinkler system being designed to BS9251, for residential buildings. This year, a revised revision of BS 9251 was released, 
This revision introduced a new sprinkler category, uh, category four, which is applicable to buildings with a residential story more than 18 meters. With this category, there is now a requirement to provide a secondary uh, power supply, such as a diesel generator for operation and loss of power. The use of this new revision, BS951, is technically not mandatory yet, as the approved document B makes reference to the older 2014 revision. Um, it's generally recommended that for new buildings to adopt the new uh, revision of BS9251. So similar to the 11 meter fire suppression threshold, ADB includes recommendations for wayfinding signage in residential buildings above 11 meters. This recommendation originates from the findings of the Grenfell inquiry, where firefighters communicated struggles with finding their way around the building in their operations. Therefore, these recommendations aim to improve the consistency of floor and flat identification signage to assist firefighting operations. Those recommendations are covered in paragraphs 15.13 till 15.16. I'll also note that there's a useful NHBC technical extra guidance note that includes some helpful diagrams to support the ADB recommendations, examples of which are shown on this slide to the left. For buildings above 18 meters, Regulation 70 applies where materials within the external wall are classified as class A2, S1, D0 or better. Consideration needs to be given to specified attachments such as balconies and solar shading devices. This is as balconies and solar shading devices could contribute to the fire spread upper building across the facade due to their projection from the external wall. Therefore, the recommendation is all materials and, component, uh, and components of balconies and solar shading devices should achieve class A1 or A2 S1 uh, D0. Green walls, due to the, to the nature of the materials used in green walls, it is unlikely that many of them will be able to achieve European uh, reaction uh, class, uh, your class A1 or A2 S1 D0, and therefore they are not permitted uh, in buildings above 18 meters. Cavity trays, so with the expectation to cavity, uh, cavity trays present within two leaves of masonry, it is expected that the cavity trays be formed from materials achieving European class A2, S1, D0 or better. As for membranes, uh, they are excluded from regulation 7.2. Uh, however, membranes are still expected to be no worse than European class B, S3, D0. However, I'm aware that you currently can find uh, products for that better class B. As for buildings less than 18 meters, Regulation 72 does not apply in, this, in, in accordance with approved documents. However, designers should be aware of the MHCLG Consolidated Advice Note issued in 2020. This advice note recommends that regardless of building height, the risk of external fire spread needs to be assessed. Therefore, implying that conforming to BS991 or ADB does not necessarily mean that you have met the functional requirements of the building regulations. As a result, this has led to many external wall surveys, commonly known as EWS1 form assessments, being required to assess the risk presented to residential buildings. The guidance note recommends that the clearest way to demonstrate that the external walls are acceptable is for the external walls to achieve Euroclass A2 or better. This past summer, in 2021, the government and MHCLG uh, commissioned an independent panel to review the risk of combustible materials present to, in medium to low-rise buildings, i.e. buildings that are less than 80 metres. This expert panel concluded that the risk presented is actually low, as such implying that the industry has been too risk-averse. So the final twist here is that the MHCLG considered advice note is going to be withdrawn, and a new PAS 9980 document will be implemented, which casts some doubt on what the recommendations actually are. This will likely leave the industry to continue recommending materials in the external walls to achieve your class A2 or better. However, we should know more about this in the near future. So this covers the main changes as per ADB and related legislation. Next, I would like to dedicate a segment to discuss anticipated changes to guidance. I must caveat the next few slides by mentioning that these recommendations are based on consultation documents that are yet to be published. Therefore, they are not applicable to current projects and may change once the guidance is formally published in the future. So the two documents that have been released this year for consultation are BS 991 Fire Guidance for Residential Developments and BB100 Fire Guidance for Schools. Uh, the next two slides will communicate some of the changes that are refer referenced in the, con in the consultation documents. I will note for clarity again that the documents were out for consultation only and, and can be subject to change, so please bear this in mind. So changes to BS 991, potentially affecting future residential schemes. 
the residential buildings uh, threshold for sprinklers was uh, is reduced to 11 meters to align itself with ADV recommendations. No surprises there. Uh, a recommendation for evacuation lifts to be provided in all residential buildings. This is a new recommendation, of course. Uh, we also see an interesting change to external walls where it is recommended they achieve class A2 S1 D0 for buildings over 11 meters. So effectively reducing the height from 18 meters to 11 going a step further from ADV. Uh, sprinkler, prote sprinkler protection to be provided in spheres and corridors, previously considered to be sterile spaces, but were not, so they weren't covered by sprinkler protection, but now it implies that it should be cover covering communal areas as well. Buildings over 18 metres to be provided with evacuation alert systems. Now, these are systems that include uh, sounders in all residential apartments, and they are only activated by the fire service should they see fit to abort a stay put policy and choose to evacuate residents. And probably the biggest proposal affecting buildings over 18 metres, uh, buildings over 18 are to be provided at least two escape stairs, unless specific prote protection room measures are, are provided to the single stair. This includes uh, measures uh, providing a stair lobby, pressurisation system serving both the stair lobby and stair itself. So in summary, you're unable to make use of a mechanical vent or natural uh, smoke vent system in single stair buildings above 80 meters. Now, of course, again, this is subject to change, so we'll see how this actually becomes a recommendation in the future or not. As for schools, the consultation includes a couple of new recommendations aligning it with ADB. Uh, the guidance clarifies that property protection standard sprinkler systems are required as a minimum and not life safety ones. For mainstream schools within the floor above 11 metres, four storeys or more, fire suppression will be required. All new SEND schools will require suppression regardless of building height. So a single storey SEN schools need sprinklers. Uh, fire alarm detection. Uh, a minimum category of an L3 fire alarm and detection system is required for mainstream schools. Detection covers escape routes uh, and rooms off of escape routes. Previously, it only had to be a manual system. Uh, minimum category of L2 system for SEN schools and boarding accommodation. Um, evacuation lifts. So the schools with two levels uh, with two levels are expected to be provided with at least one single evacuation lift. Schools with three levels or more should be provided with at least two uh, lifts subject to capacity assessments. And finally, compartmentation. Single storey schools do not need to have uh, do not have a compartmentation limit, uh, thus providing some extra flexibility for designers. Multi storey schools, on the other hand, see an increase in permitted compartment sizes. Previously, it used to be 800 meters squared and now it's uh, it goes up to 2000 meters squared. So now that we've briefly covered potential future changes, I would like to run through a couple of common design issues we see on projects. So to start with, stair protection requirements in residential buildings. In a single stair building serving all levels, each lobby or the corridor serving the stair is required to be provided with a smoke ventilation system to protect the stair from smoke egress. There is a reliance on L5, a communal fire detection system that activates the smoke and ventilations only. So in the single stair, smoke ventilation is always to be automatically activated by smoke detection. This can be achieved by either 1.5 meter squared AMV, a natural smoke shaft, or a mechanical smoke shaft. However, for multiple stairs, the key difference here is that the smoke ventilation may be activated manually. However, we still we still see that it's good practice uh, for smoke ventilation to be activated automatically, and this is quite common nowadays. So this slide is going to focus on the connection of ancillary accommodation to stairs. We see this commonly overlooked within uh, designs and it requires changes often throughout the duration of the project. So ancillary accommodation connecting to multiple stairs. Um, stairs can connect to normal hazard rooms such as a storeroom by, uh, by providing a separate unventilated lobby. Stairs may also connect to a high hazard room such as a car park, provided that 0.4 meters squared per ventilation is provided. However, for any ancillary accommodation connecting to a single stair, uh, different limitations apply. The single stair is permitted to connect to a normal hazard ancillary accommodation. Um, the stair needs to be provided with at least 0.4 meters squared permanent ventilation. And rather importantly here, high hazard ancillary accommodation, i.e. such as a car park or a boiler room, uh, is not permitted to connect to a single stair under prescriptive guidance. 
it can be considered acceptable to connect a high hazard room to a stair, providing that the mechanical smoke ventilation system is proposed and offers protection from egress of smoke. This would need to be agreed with the approving authorities, i.e. building control and the fire service, by means of conducting CFD analysis. An alternative approach to CFD analysis would be the provision of smoke curtains that completely separate the connection to the single stair. However, there are other considerations to maintenance of fire curtains and making the layout arrangements work with the remaining exits available in the scheme uh, if that uh, route is adopted. And finally, for stair protection requirements in relation to connections to the basement accommodation, it is not permitted to connect a basement accommodation to uh, two single stairs, i.e. you should provide two separate stairs, uh, one serving the upper levels and the other serving the basement accommodation. With multiple stairs, uh, basement accommodation may connect, may connect, providing at least one of the stairs terminates at ground level. Next issue we come across is re-entering corners. Re-entering corners may also be known as flanking corners. They require protection to prevent fire spread by means of radiant heat breaching compartments externally. Perspective guidance only explicitly refers to internal angles to protected stairways. However, in our view, we feel like this definition extends to any two compartments where an internal angle or corner is less than 135 degrees. Therefore, the design layouts arrangements should prevent fire spread from occurring around walls. To achieve this, a 1.8 metre fire rated segment via the external corner of the facade, as shown in the diagrams to the left, um, is, is recommended. Evacuation lifts, uh, <laughs> quite a hot topic in industry. Uh, evacuation uh, lifts are another, another one that causes design implications if not initially planned for. Evacuation lifts uh, safe, uh, are safe to use in the event of a fire, unlike your traditional passenger lifts. Uh, for those working in on London projects, it's required to satisfy policy D5 uh, of the London Plan 2021, which addresses dignified means of escape. Although not currently a recommendation to satisfy building regulations, i.e. ADB um, and uh, VS 991, they are likely to be introduced in, in future legislation, as I discussed earlier. The things to remember here, the, these evacuation lifts must be treated similar to a protected stair. So they have to be protected, so they have to have a protected discharge route at ground level to the external. They also have to have lobbies where, with disabled refugees present within them. They should have a secondary power supply that operates in the loss of power, and they should have trained staff uh, that, are, uh, that are only permitted to operate them to help facilitate evacuation. Next up, I'd like to mention fire service access and firefighting provisions. On projects we've come across within the Wessex and South, West, uh, and South Wales regions, uh, inadequate water flow from hydrants is quite common. And thus, we have had requests from the fire service to include supplementary firefighting water tanks that are topped up periodically across the year. So this firefighting water tank is a large emergency tank that is accessed by the event uh, in the event of a fire by the firefighting crews as a backup resource if uh, they don't have uh, sufficient water um, uh, if they come to fight fire. Another issue we come across is access to the dry riser inlet position being further than 18 metres away from the fire appliance. Therefore, the general recommendation is that the fire tender access is provided as close to the entrance lobbies where the dry riser inlet is positioned. Uh, the fire service, from our experience, are very strict on this requirement. Uh, then staying on the topic of fire service access, it is not expected that a fire tender vehicle uh, can reverse more than 20 metres if no turning facilities are provided. This becomes an issue on projects that are situated in densely populated, uh, pop, uh, populated areas uh, where perimeter access is limited. And uh, so to close out the presentation, I'd like to cover the subject of on-site fire safety auditing. Uh, the photos on the next few slides are from various projects where our fire management teams have visited the site to collect evidence. Unfortunately, more often than we'd like to see, it is evidence, uh, there's evidence suggesting that key fire safety provisions such as cavity barriers and fire stopping are installed incorrectly or inappropriately. And so this is not in line with prescriptive guidance or manufacturer's recommendations. I'd like to run through a couple of these uh, now. For, so for images one and two, the cavity barriers are placed in the hollowed out sections of the combustible insulation. We also see an attempt to fix those uh, with tape uh, I'll quickly just um, highlight this on the slides. You can see from the second image, one or two, is that it's hollowed out in the slides. Um, of, in, in image three, um, as part of the external wall survey, we were investigating the provision of cavity barriers around the windows uh, in the external wall system. A brick was removed to check uh, that there's a cavity barrier around the window, as you would expect. 
This arrangement included the cavity sock, which can be seen in green, uh, but it did not fill the minimal wall and it was missing, uh, that was missing within the sleeve. So effectively it wasn't providing any protection around the opening whatsoever. So it didn't serve any purpose. And uh, image four highlights uh, an, a horizontal cavity barrier that abuts to a series of gas pipes running vertically up the building. The horizontal cavity barrier continued um, and the gas pipes to the right. So you, it just effectively goes down, leaving a gap uh, and which allows for the for the travel of smoke, a pathway for smoke and fire to travel, uh, which wouldn't be as intended. Um, and, uh, and images five and six on this slide, a cavity barrier around windows. Um, this image shows the installation of a cavity barrier adjacent to a cladding bracket. Um, this bracket has created the gap in the system that allows for the travel smoke of heat through the cavity. So it's not something we would expect to see. And finally, an extreme example, uh, this should be a video which, can, which should be playing now on your slides. Um, we've, we see uh, this we've only seen once uh, in all honesty, but this video shows a horizontal cavity bear with what we were expecting to see an intumescent strip uh, to that cavity bear in black. Uh, which, as we know, would expand and close any gaps uh, to prevent fire spread from one compartment to another. After taking a closer look, tape has been disguised to look like an intermessent strip, clearly an attempt to mislead inspectors. So all this to say that these occurrences do happen on site, uh, so it's good to, to bear this in mind. So thank you for your time and I'm happy to take on any questions. If you can't get to you today, feel free to send an email and I'll get back to you as soon as, as possible. I'll hand over back to Usman. Thank you very much, Taj. That was absolutely great. Um, we have we have a, a fair few questions um, uh, coming through, so let me just have a quick look uh, at those. Um, but. Um, Maybe if I just jump to something which is a hot topic, which I believe was in the press last week, um, was that there's a um, an update highlighting, I think, from Fire Authority in London that a lot of developers are actually building below the 11 meters, just below the 11 meters, etc., um, to avoid um, yeah. additional measures, etc. Um, what what um, feedback have you uh, been receiving? as uh, from the far so side of uh, consulting side of things in regard to that type of issue um, in the um, in the marketplace. So um, we've we've come across uh, developers trying to to I, I don't suppose game the system, I suppose, is by developing your your schemes to 10.9 meters above that threshold, which is not something we'd like to see because you because you're you're clearly trying to not comply with the requirements afterwards uh, above 11 meters. So um, we've we've seen examples of people trying to avoid the requirement. Yes, so I, I understand why the fire service have made that recommendation. Um, I can't. We haven't come across that specifically in yet, uh, but we know we are aware it's an issue and we try to advise our clients that uh, if you're building close to 11 meters, then do do consider these provisions anyway, because even when it comes to the fire service consultation, they're going to be requested, they're going to be discussed. And to be honest, as a fire engineer, we can support that. If it's closer to the 11 meter rule, we should be sticking with the additional provisions. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we've got a uh, question from Chris. Um, uh, is is uh is the standards related to stories or is it related to the height of the building or is it much of the same so the specific question is is this for buildings over five plus stories um so I just want that clarification on on that specific nuance so yeah it's five stories or more and if it's above 18 as well so it's, it's a bit of both the the wording has been updated to reflect that yeah so mm, a bit of great both. Mm. Uh, uh, we've got a question from Nuria. Uh, it's a little bit ambiguous, so if you could please um, extrapolate so that we can have a look at that. But we've got another question in from uh, Silesh. Uh, does the gate does a gateway one require a form of a hard stop or signing documentation similar to gateway two? Could the planning consent be given and problems arise arise at gateway two? How do you ensure assure the intent of gate, gateway one is followed throughout? 
So Gateway 1, actually, as I was explaining on the side, I mean, it only really covers for fire safety. It only really covers um, fire tender access around the site um, and site planning issues. So the degree of information that goes into that statement, to be honest, should be fulfilled throughout. You're talking about fire service access, which should be clarified at the earliest opportunity. Um, so the, you'd expect that these provisions are covered throughout. Uh, so that's why they're requested. But the, the, all this to say that it's not a full fire safety strategy. So this can be development post um, planning gateway one and planning, planning gateways two and three, as we'd expect in a, any fire safety strategy. Um, so it's just to say that the, the, the fire service access element of planning gateway one needs to be resolved at the earliest opportunity. And I think that's why we think it's a good addition to the planning gateway one requirements as a minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question in from uh, uh, Giancarlo. Uh, so is the assumption that a principal contractor is appointed by stage uh, by Gateway 2, i.e. before the works are tendered, as in some scenarios a principal contractor is, a, is not appointed until after they have won the tender? I'm guessing maybe he's referring to almost a provision uh, for mm -hmm. some analysis before it goes out for tendering, I think that's what he's referring to. Essentially, yeah. Um, in all honesty, the, the gateway two and three are yet to be defined, and these are still uh, the minimum requirements are yet to be defined. So it's uh, it's difficult for us to comment on as the the government actually haven't given you the requirements yet. But um, we'd we'd expect an element of the contractor being involved because eventually you need to you need to sign declarations of of uh, of acceptance that the building has been designed correctly and in, in accordance with the approved documents or the fire guidance. So um, I don't know about the specifics of the question and how that actually works, but I expect the principal contractor would be involved earlier than currently um, than currently it is. That makes sense. Uh, we've got a, uh, a message from uh, QDOT. Uh, you, uh, you made mention about an evacuation lift being applicable um, just wanted clarification whether that was applicable to all residential buildings or whether it's specific types of buildings that's the specific question so yeah so under the london plan 2021 uh, it's a planning requirement to provide an evacuation lift and that is for all buildings including residential buildings schools every every single building would be expected to be provided with an evacuation lift if a provision for a lift has been made for so that's something that applies to the London plan in the London region. Uh, outside of London, this isn't currently a requirement, but I was, as I was covering in the, in the slides earlier, it is expected to be introduced in the future for schools and all residential buildings in general. So this would, this would cover all types of residential accommodation. Uh, so your typical block of flats will need one. And this obviously already is a problem that management associations are thinking about because then they have to have a, a suitably qualified person and trained to help evacuate people from a residential block, which is an extra cost for developers that wasn't required before. So th yes, we've come across that in London and we expect that to be extended to later on. But uh, I should say that the slides uh, shown about anticipated changes are not yet published, so they're not yet applicable. They could change in the future also. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a uh, question in from Sophie. Uh, do you have any comments on open state cavity barriers in external wall cladding systems? Um, there's a rumour that these might uh, not be allowed in future because they let smoke past them prior to the intumescent expanding. OK, well, um, I, I don't <laughs> I don't have any any comments personally. I'm sure it will come in the future, uh, but if it's it's a common obviously cavity barrier as everyone knows and if it actually has been installed correctly on site uh, and it actually does uh, perform as tested then there's no reason to, to suggest that its provision is is uh, inappropriate however as i was showing in the slides the, you know we do have issues with people not following manufacturers recommendations so like that's probably where the rumors come from maybe to stop that uh, bad uh, installation process i suppose that's um, seen in so many buildings so i, I don't know about the rumor or, or, or can't comment on it but it's, it's something that i see why it's developed to that point yeah OK, great. Thanks for that. Uh, we've got a question. Uh, Nuria has clarified her question. Um, she's referring to Gateway 3. You talked about uh, co-signing council, yeah. architect, engineer, etc. Yeah. Um, could you clarify that point, please? 
no, it's just a recommendation that's come through. Uh, effectively, it's it's a statement saying that, to the best of our knowledge, uh, the what we've designed here is to is in compliance with the building regulations. That's the general expected um, provision that's going to be uh, happening at Gateway Three. Um, so yeah, that's that's all we know at the moment. It's not set in, set in stone and undefined, unfortunately, but that's as far as we know. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then we've got a question in from Darren. Is the cavity tray fire rated up to two hours for over 18 meter buildings? Yeah, we'd expected it. Uh, well, uh, we expected to achieve European class A2 S1 D0. That's different to uh, the fire rating uh, if the cavity bar is is the, the tray is, is part of the external wall system. It only needs to achieve your class A2. If it impacts on structural fire resistance, uh, then if you have a building that's above 18, you'd expect it to be 90 meters. And if it's above 30, 120 minutes. So I wonder if if that's what we're trying to discuss here. Uh, but the in terms of the European classification required for the trays, they need to be class uh, A2 or better, A2 S1 D0 or better. Great, thank you for that. Uh, question in from Dan. Uh, does the potential introduction of sprinklers and stairs triple nine one not create a health and safety risk with people trying to escape down wet surface, uh, wet surfaces? So yeah, it's, it's a valid point, and this is kind of surprised us when we when we saw it out in the consultation document. Um, what I would say is again, it's it's subject to change, and um, it, it's, as I think the provision was introduced uh, so that it compensates for uh, for if there's any breach in compartmentation or if your smoke control systems don't work as intended. So at least you have the sprinkler system activated within those common areas as well. Um, but yes, that I completely understand that the, why the question is asked is because it does introduce those elements of slip hazard um, it could be something that's reviewed and not published uh, afterwards but we can't really comment on that yeah we've got time for a few more questions uh, fingers crossed we'll get through all of them uh, we've got a question in from Jenny uh, is the overall height measured uh, to EU slash ridge I'm guessing that probably goes back to if you're on the borderline you should probably yeah. be considered yeah okay sorry anyway yes. i don't mean to to answer your question but please do answer that question. no it's yeah you're right uh, that's our recommendation would be our recommendation not to disguise the requirement uh it's not it's, it's something that building control and the fire service don't like at all and i completely understand you're you're disguising your design to make it look like it's it it's, it doesn't have to achieve those provisions uh, it's not recommended yeah okay great uh Chris, question in from Ezra uh, given the increase in awareness of the climate crisis are there any updates regarding the use of CLT in buildings over 80 meters and then I'll just extrapolate further um, is it what's your um, awareness of uh, materiality being developed with obviously the two very closely interlinked probably acoustics probably is the only other thing that you'd so at this level it can join sustainability fire and sort of acoustic side of things. Um, it'd be interesting to hear your answer on that. So outside the UK, um, as many of us might have seen, especially in the Scandinavian countries and, and some really good examples in America, buildings are being built CLT uh, above 18 metres and that's starting to become, uh, you're starting to see more precedence of that. In the UK, um, uh, it's it's uh, i understand my understanding is that there's still the testing or generally we required more testing to prove that such a system is reliable uh, and acts as intended uh, fire engineering analysis uh, fire structural fire engineering analysis is usually conducted to confirm that it's just there's always an approach or hesitation i suppose because it does uh, it's not a traditional building method it, it introduces some new problems uh, for fighting a fire and its performance um post fire and if it's uh, and if it's structural integrity in general so um i'm unaware of any precedents in the uk um that are above 18 meters uh, it's difficult to usually uh, to build that high with clt currently although you know the interesting in the industry is generally moving forward to accommodate that um so yeah that's, that's just generally the thoughts on it uh, but yeah there's outstanding precedents outside of the uk in the norwegian countries that actually do have built that so that it is possible We've got three more questions, um, so uh, we'll definitely be finishing on time, everybody. So just um, uh, just bear with us. Uh, we've got a question in from Trevor. Would you say EN Commission document 2000 forward slash 
three forward slash EC is still valid where it states under specific conditions for roof covering products, there is no need for testing. Sorry, could you repeat that for a second there? That's a couple of uh, just came through. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Uh, would you say EN Commission document 2000 forward slash 553 forward slash EC is still valid where it states under specific conditions for roof covering products, there is no need for testing? Um, I'm unaware of that to that depth. If I'm being completely honest, I'd have to check that myself. Um, but generally, as probably the, the person who asked the question knows, uh, yeah, roof coverings need to achieve the recommendations as per ADB 9191, B roof T4, etc. The different, uh, there are different uh, ways of testing. So uh, one, so it's B roof T1, T, T2 systems. They're applicable differently in different countries. But um, the current uh, testing is for wind, radiation, um, and fire performance. Uh, and yeah, the, that's the roof companies would expect, uh, what we'd be recommending anyway, that they achieve uh, the building regulations as a minimum. Uh, such a specific question, we'd have to review the documentation uh, and see what its applicability, uh, applicability is. Uh, I know I haven't answered the question, but it is something we, I have to look into probably. Yeah, and that hopefully gives a, a couple more questions, but hopefully that gives a good segue in regard to obviously contacting uh, Taj and their team at Hydrock if you'd like to uh, field any specific queries. Um, they this is something they generally do, so um, uh, they they give out uh, sort of an open call for anyone that is actually uh, present at the webinars uh, to get in touch, and they hope to get back in touch with you with an answer on your queries within 10 working days. Um, so please do feel free to get in touch and ask um, the, the myriad of specialists uh, in the fire department um, uh, any questions you may have, project specific or gen generic, um, they're more than happy to help. Um, so just uh, two more, uh, a question in from uh, uh, Lolan. If you needed supervision on evacuation lifts, this implies you would have to have staff full time on yeah. any building with an evacuation lift as you wouldn't know where an alarm would be triggered. So yeah, completely right. So um, I think the the the, the reason uh, evacuation lifts have become such a hot topic is obviously from the London plan promoting it. The the idea is uh, is commendable is that you don't want to have disabled uh, disabled users uh, if their flat was on fire that they don't have any other means of escape other than going into the stair and and essentially escaping that way, which is which is against the state policy. So really, it's one to help facilitate evacuation for disabled users. Um, so that's why it's there in the first place. Um, and yes, the, the training requirement is something that's come up on many of our projects. Um, the, the design teams have gone <laughs> in different ways. The clients have gone to employ people that come to site afterwards, after the fire has happened, um, after the fire is developing, I suppose, or they have a, a policy where they're relying on the fire service to help facilitate to use the evacuation lift. And uh, so it's there if they need it. Um, so yeah, again, um, it's is something that is still being investigated. We've heard of different solutions being there. There's there's a concept of remote uh, monitoring, something that's done remotely. Um, but again, the, the intricacies of that is yet to be defined. So um, so the, the requirement is yes, you you need a trained person to be able to evacuate people using the evacuation lift. That is the recommendation. And unfortunately, there's no guidance after that. It's down to the client to manage how that happens. OK, great. Um, I think we'll leave it there um, as a uh, mindful. I don't want to over overrun with the talk. Um, I've just popped on. Uh, so thank you very much, Taj, uh, Taj for uh, your nice. detailed talk on uh, fire safety design and common design issues. That's absolutely great. I've been getting a lot of good feedback um, in the chat box. Um, I've just popped on a link to Hydrox website where they've got a series of webinars, which they've also been doing over the last couple of years, uh, which are free to um, view. So please do. I mean, if you haven't had a chance, to click the link is literally just type in Hydrock webinars and it should come up probably at the top of the search. Um, there's uh, as they're multidisciplinary, they've covered quite a wide range of topics. Um, as usual, um, we are not offering CPD certificates uh, in regard to copy of the slides. Those will be made available via Eventbrite uh, email uh, in due course, hopefully at some point this week. Um, so please do keep an eye out for that. Um, 
and uh, in regard to upcoming events please just keep an eye on our social medias and also our Eventbrite page we will be advertising them in due course please do come along to those if you have any specific topics you'd like us to cover please do let us know we're more than happy to um, uh, have a look at those and in introduce additional items to our calendar um, hopefully everyone's had a great time this year um, this is obviously our last talk for the year so uh, thank you, everybody. Hope you, everybody has a great rest of the year, and we look forward to seeing you in 2022. Um, I, uh, so I believe that's it from us at Syat Wessex. Uh, thank you again from Taj from Hydrock, and thank you thank for you. the rest of the committee uh, for supporting uh, the um, series throughout the year. Hopefully, we've managed to reach um, professionals far and wide, and. Uh, everyone's benefited from these talks that we've had. Um, we're looking to continue them and uh, please do uh, sign up and we hope to see you at our first talk in the new year. Thanks everyone. Thanks for your time.